James, thank you very much indeed for joining us today at the Forum for the Future of Agriculture's annual conference. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, by asking you a, a question about something that you, you frequently discuss about how we've lost touch with, with nature. How and why do you think that's happened and what do you think the consequences have been for the planet? Well, you know, when I was a child, there was no television. There was none of the the um, electronic devices that take up so much of young people's time today. And also, we've moved into a very materialistic society, you know, as religion decreased, so people came became more and more tied up with material things. And I think schools used to spend more time in nature study and nature walks. And now they're so busy preparing young people to find a place in this this rat race, really, to make them prepared uh, to find their way to make money, to achieve success. Success today, which is based on um, more power and more wealth accumulation. And so it's 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 really sad that we have become so disconnected from nature, partly because uh, it's damaging nature and partly because it's now been proven that we need time in nature for our physical and mental health. You, you talked about some pretty powerful forces there, Jane, in terms of how we've lost our connection to nature. I suppose that the, the follow-up is, is how do we counteract that? How do we, how do we restore our connection to nature? Well, I think, first of all, it's about raising awareness and people are becoming more aware it's terribly important that people understand that we are part of and not separated from the natural world, that we actually depend on the natural world for food, air, water, everything. But what we depend on is healthy ecosystem. And an ecosystem is made up of this complex mix of animals and plants, and each one has a role to play. And I like to see it as a living tapestry. And every time a species becomes extinct in that tapestry, it's like pulling out a thread. And if we pull out enough threads, the tapestry hangs in tatters and the ecosystem will collapse. And that's what's happening around the world. Ecosystems are collapsing. And as people begin to understand the importance of preserving biodiversity, as people begin to understand that it's our damage to nature that's caused climate change, which of course is affecting everyone around the world now, and that the loss of biodiversity is creating these unhealthy ecosystems, then perhaps with more education, more examples to follow, we can start to change things. But we've got to go to the governments and the businesses, and sometimes businesses are changed by consumer pressure, people beginning to understand that they need to shop ethically. And governments, of course, well, at least in democracies, we elect them. This counts for the European Union. You know, people elect governments. And so we need responsible voters. I like the way you describe that. It certainly resonates with me of pulling, pulling the threads. And, and we've pulled a lot of threads creating this, this crisis for biodiversity, for, for species, for the ecosystems, for the climate. Um, and you touched on, on the role of governments in there. Obviously, the forum itself has a global outlook, but we are based in Europe. Um, when you look at the European Union and what it's done with its Green Deal, which some argue is, is pioneering, do you think that they've shown the leadership? How would you assess that um, globally? And do you think there's more that they need to do? Well, first of all, you know, the series of ambitious targets that are set out in the Green Deal, if all of these targets were actually brought into law, and actually implemented, then the EU would be showing tremendous leadership. Um, 
whether this will happen or not depends on everybody who's involved. It depends on the will of the different governments and to some extent on the will of the people. And could the EU be doing more? Well, you know, first of all, I love the bill that means the EU cannot uh, import products that have been based on destruction of the forest. And that, of course, will upset many of the uh, importing countries because they will have to change, in some cases, their legislation about forest protection. But it it is, as we think of the future of the planet, the protection of forests, one of the great lungs of the world, absorbing CO2 and giving out oxygen. You know, this is a tremendous step forward. Uh, what more can be done? Well, <laughs> enforcing the uh, legislation as it's passed is one thing. Min and, and, you know, following up on commitments made, which I see again and again, countries make commitments, but they don't actually follow up on them. I think a good deal could be done in the EU about improving the regulation of welfare of farmed animals. And uh, tragically, billions and billions of animals uh, cause tremendous suffering. And you know, there's now proof that animals are sentient beings. And that means not just chimpanzees, apes, monkeys, whales, dolphins, elephants, and so on, but every single farmed animal is sentient, has a personality, is capable of feeling depression, fear, and of course, pain. And these long journeys of live animals from one country to another, often in terrible conditions. The conditions inside the factory farms, the cramped conditions, the uh, intense suffering caused by the methods of slaughter and care, that certainly could be improved. Thank you for that. I mean, the forum is all about trying to get new ideas and insights onto the table. And I know you've talked about that in the past, but we appreciate the, the further um, examples of what the EU could do. I wonder if I could just move away from that for a second and, and talk about the Roots and Shoots program, um, which I know is, is, is important to you, powers young people and, and local communities. But perhaps you could say a little bit more about just why that is so important to you and, and perhaps any examples that are already emerging from that that are making a difference. Yeah, well, I would love to talk about that because I think it's the one of the main principal focuses of the rest of my life, however long I have. I mean, I'm already nearly 89, but it began because even back in the late 80s, even back then, young people seemed to be losing hope and they were either depressed or angry or mostly just apathetic. And when I asked them, and this is right around the world, well, Basically, they said the same thing. You've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Not only have we compromised their future, we've been stealing it probably since the Industrial Revolution. And But I still believed and believe that we have a window of time when if we get together, we can slow down climate change and the loss of biodiversity. So... It all began with 12 high school students in Tanzania, and they were concerned about things that were happening in the environment. So I said to them, well, look, let's get together and see what you can do. So we got together and we decided the main message for this program that came to be called Roots and Shoots would be every individual matters, makes a difference, has a role to play every single day. Secondly, because nature and, and societies have such interconnection that we would have every group doing three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And so what began with these 12 high school students now has members from kindergarten all the way through university it's in 67 countries and growing, hundreds and thousands of young people. 
uh, all working to make the world a better place. Some of the early ones back in the 1990s, they're already in decision-making positions and truly making an impact on the world. So, you know, what, what are they doing that's special? I, I can't begin to tell you because they get to choose their projects. So the mm -hmm. projects will differ depending on their age, um, their environment, the country they're in, if they're rich or poor, and so forth. But, for example, they are planting literally millions of trees around the world. They're working on restoring mangrove forests. And, of course, that's tremendously important as sea levels rise and as storms get worse due to uh, changing weather patterns and climate change. Um, they're, they're becoming the leaders of the future. And they seem, as they grow out of school, out of university, to hang on to the main values that they acquire in Roots and Shoots, which basically is respect and compassion for each other, for animals, and for the environment. So I'm really proud of these young people and what they are doing. Another thing, they're influencing their parents. Mummy, um, you mustn't buy that. It hurts the environment. Mummy, you mustn't buy that because it was cruel to animals. And as they get older, you shouldn't buy that food because it's cheap, because that means there's unfair wages in some part of the world, which means we must alleviate poverty and we must reduce unsustainable lifestyles. Because if we carry on with a growing population and have this crazy idea that can be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite re resources, we are doomed. It, it's an extraordinary program, Jane, and I, I can only offer humbly my own congratulations for what has been achieved there. And might I say also that it perhaps speaks to that restoring the connection with nature that you talked about earlier on in our discussion. I wonder if I might, might close by asking you a final question, which is really um, perhaps some advice for our audience that is with us in the Forum for the Future of Agriculture today. Um, they do represent stakeholders really from across the agri-food system. What do you think are the most urgent items that need to be worked upon and, and what can the stakeholder audience of people from the system do to, to take action themselves? Well, one way of taking action is to move towards a plant-based diet because um, industrial agriculture is having such a terrible impact on the environment. So that's one thing. And then to encourage farmers by buying their produce who are moving into more sustainable forms of agriculture, uh, such as regenerative farming. And of course, growing organically, that goes without saying. Uh, moving into permaculture, uh, moving into ways of farming without relying on these chemical pesticides and herbicides and all this artificial fertilizer because these are the ways of farming that are working with nature rather than against nature. And actually, farmers are able to produce more on this kind of farm because there's ground cover, which means water retention. Um, it's a better habitat for pollinators and for the natural predators on insect pests. And so the way we shop as individuals, what we choose to buy, who we are supporting, whether it's uh, in the production of food or other goods, whether it's what politicians we support, in every one of these ways, individuals can make a difference unless they're living in abject poverty. Jane, um, we, we've been very fortunate down the years in the forum to have a whole variety of perspectives of people that have come to us and, and shared with us their point of view. Um, it's been a privilege um, to talk to you on behalf of the forum. Thank you very much indeed for spending time with us and, and thank you for everything that you've done in, in, in your life and we wish you continued success with everything else that's in front of you. Jane Goodall, thank you very much indeed for joining us.
Well, and thank you for inviting me to share a few words because this for me is a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you.